All right. Welcome back to another episode of the Investor Financing Podcast. Today is going to be a good one. We're going to talk about beekeeping and how beekeeping can relate to real estate investing. We're going to talk to a real estate investor who was uh, a psychologist for 30 years. He's helped over 12,000 people. I think a lot of real estate investors need a psychologist as well. <laughs> but he's, but most importantly for this show, he's been in, investing in real estate for 40 years. He's a Canadian. Uh, we, we allow Canadians on the show too, even though it's mostly <laughs> Americans here that watch. And actually, I, I deal with a lot of Canadians. A lot of Canadians like to buy uh, uh, in the States too. So Huge. Um, yeah, but there's user. opportunities in Canada as well. Just talking to you before we went live. Yep. So please welcome Henry Speck to the show. I call him Hank because uh, he gets better deals from his contractors when <laughs> when he goes by Hank and drives his beat up pickup truck. Thanks, Bo. <laughs> <laughs> welcome to the show. Thank you very much. So you have such an interesting background. When did you first like kind of get involved in real estate and and was that a mistake or you just it, kind of stumbled a, into it? I bumbled and stumbled through most things till about 10 years ago. So that for the first 25 years or so, that was usually need. So when I got out of Michigan State, I went to Michigan State as an adult student. We had two children, just young kids at the time, Honda Civic. And there was a foreclosure for sale. It was 1987. And this bank was selling this house near the railroad tracks. Uh, it, I picked it up for fifty-two thousand, and they gave me an extra three grand on closing. I was able to get a fifty-six thousand dollars mortgage on a fifty-two thousand dollars purchase, and my wife went nuts, I went nuts, and we were able to make our payments. And then in the back was a place where people could put cars. You know, guys want to get away from the house and work on a car, so we made a, a bunch of little garages and we rented. I was cash flowing like six or seven hundred dollars a month, and just coming out of school with kids. And it was right near a grain elevator, right near the railroad tracks. We're not talking a great house, but it, it, I ha we kept that for probably 15 years. It continued to cash flow. We paid 56, and I think we sold it for 89 grand in the end. So it was our first purchase. And then I kept buying after that different properties. And then eventually, uh, we had three boys, went on to university, couldn't afford it. So we bought our first house in a university town and said, get five roommates so we can pay off. So then we started buying more and more properties in a place called Waterloo, Ontario. Uh, then that got really insane. Uh, it went from 40000 a bed to seventy five and $100,000 a bed to buy. So we sold out there. And another son was going out east uh, to work. Actually, he wanted to volunteer for a year to try to get a job, and he had no money. So I said, if I buy a really lousy multi-unit and make him manage it, I can justify paying 500 bucks a month to do that. So we bought properties out there. So we kind of just did things out of need. And then eventually, as in my profession, I'm, I'm quite outspoken. I realized I need some backup plans. Um, so I did that, and that's when we got serious. And I think the first scary one was when we bought our first mil uh, building for a million bucks, and that caused us a great deal of uh, joy, initially anxiety, and later joy. That's a great story. So talk to me about one of your um, one of your bad deals that maybe ended up being a good deal, and then tell us about one of your home run deals. Oh, wow. A bad deal that was a good deal would probably have been what we called the Rinder building. It was an old bakery in town. And I bought it with two buddies and I hadn't had any partners before. And it was okay, but ended up, there was a living room in one of the apartments and it was also kind of zoned commercial. And so we turned the living room into a retail outlet and kept the three units and it was cash flowing like a thousand plus dollars. And we ended up selling it um, because we just, you know, the partnership thing. So then recently, probably about five years later, a large drugstore chain came in and bought up all the lousy houses there and put up a big building. So if we'd hung on to it, we would have done, you know, exceptionally well. And what was the second part of the question, sir? Now, tell us, tell us about a deal that you like. It was an absolute home run, one of your kind of legacy deals so far oh i've been really lucky so i i had my practice in this building this absolutely beautiful building and the dentist owned the building and i wanted to buy my half where my practice was because his dental practice was in the front so i had a meeting with them and they said and i thought i would be paying about three hundred thousand for my half and they came to the meeting and and i i said well how much were you thinking of getting and she said well we would sell it for the mortgage and I thought she meant like 
my half, but she meant the whole building. So instead of 300 for the half, I was going to buy the building for 370. And then she said, but there's one other problem. I said, what's the problem? She said, well, we have this lot that's, that's sort of around the corner and we'd want you to take the lot too for that price. Like we just want to, we don't, we don't want to have to ha have the hassle of the lot. And I thought like, you're giving me a lot. You, so I, we had the meeting and I said, sure. And then I checked with everybody. You know, is there toxic waste? Is it a nuclear site? Like, why would people give me this deal? Turns out, no, it was straight up front. They just didn't want the building anymore. He came back as my tenant. So he made all the payments that were necessary as a tenant, which I never understood. I sold a lot, I think for 29 or 30 grand that they gave me. Uh, and we ended up selling the building. We bought it for three something. We sold it for 780 just before I, I retired. And we also had solar on the roof. So we made money on the solar here in Canada. We had a crazy solar uh, opportunity for a few years. So we took advantage of that. So that was one. Of, I've had a number of really lucky deals, like incredibly lucky, yeah. crazy lucky. I just did one. I, you want to hear another one? I just did. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, there's two actually. So about a week ago, I've been eyeing this property. It was 95 acres of oceanfront property. The ocean's just across the road. Uh, 20 minutes from a university town and they had wanted 400,000 for it. And I, I've been watching a year ago, they wanted 400,000 and then they wanted 280 and then 190, 170, 120. And we agreed reached an agreement at 95 grand the other day for 95 acres. And it's absolutely, it's all elevated. So you can see the entire ocean and it's 20 minutes from a university town. So that's pretty exciting. So, um, so let's, let's stop right there. What, so it's raw dirt right now. What's, what, what's in your mind, and we're going to probably get into land banking in a minute, but what what's the plan with the property? What what's the what are you going to do to like? Are you going to parcel it off? Or are you going to build out some properties? What's your exit on that? And what's the long term plan? Well, because I'm a, I'm 67, um, th there there are two options. The first is I want to. It was it was clear cut logged, so all of the trees had been cut down, but a few probably about 10 years ago. So like the bee farm here, one of my project is, you know, restoration, nature preservation, restoration. And, and with land banking, if you can do that, I think you're giving back, but you also have that asset should something happen and we need to deal with it. So before I purchase it, I don't close until May. I have a person that I really trust who'll do all the background on bylaws and so on in case it has to be severed and divided. It could probably be anywhere from two to 20 lots if you had to. Um, my plan is to restore it and do what are called um, environmental footprint credits. So let's say you live in a house and it's 3,000 square feet. To build your 3,000 square foot home, you had to displace 3,000 square foot of nature, let's say. We have a piece of land that we're restoring and we have it you know, registered on title. We have an arborist file the plan. For $25 a year, you can purchase the rights to take care of 3,000 square feet of our property, which makes up for what you're, you've done to live. We call it a simple footprint. I guess it's a swap or whatever. So, and, go ahead. So, so essentially, you're going to get developers that want to get this, use your the credits from your land so they can go and build on their land and they're going to basically lease it from you? They could do that, yeah. Or people like anybody, like there's a huge. I was just came back from an environmental co uh, conference where the largest. This isn't carbon offsets, but we do include the carbon offset in the three thousand square feet. The largest market right now is voluntary carbon offsets. So everybody understands there's something they want to do, but we haven't given I think people an opportunity to do that. Regardless, I'll plant clover, bring in honeybees. It'll be an amazing spot, and someday if if need be, my great grandchildren or children can put like you know fifty houses there. That's pretty cool. So yeah, you could potentially just cash flow from these people leasing or buying, you know, an acre or two or three acres or X amount of, they probably do similar things here in the States too. I'm guessing. Yeah, it's not, you don't purchase the land, you get the rights, you get the 3000 square foot certificate saying, this is what you're supporting for five years. We still own the land. So, so, okay, got it. So then they can have that so if they wanted to build a single family home on a lot that didn't have that, they could get the because they're using yeah. the credit from there. They're yeah. showing, hey, I'm, I'm, we're, we're growing trees on this property or whatever. Well, here's the better one. If you own a company and you have, say, 200 employees, 
Young people today want to know you as an employer have a stake in the environment, like you care about the environment. You could actually sponsor every one of your employees. So if I come to work for you for 25 bucks a year, you've offset my 3,000 square foot home that I live in or apartment or condo. And every year you get the drone videos, you get involvement if we're doing a restoration, you know, so it becomes a sort of, that's sort of the plan. It's, it's kind of fun for me, but it's also restoring an incredibly beautiful spot back to nature and honeybees and bumblebees and all that kind of stuff. So that's one idea of, of, of a project that uh, is pretty cool. And that's, that's outside the box. I think I never had a conversation about this before, but there's, as an investor, you can do really creative things and make, uh, this hundred thousand dollar property, which was sitting forever, nobody wanted to buy. Now you could, it, it'll you can get this thing to actually be a very lucrative, you know, bi business for uh, from the time being from from now as a cash flow perspective. And then what's the value of this large plot of land that sits across from the ocean? Because we know they're not building any more, they're not making any more land. So that's what really land banking is. Yeah, we're 350 feet above sea level, right? So we have these incredible views. And, and at my age, I can tell you, there's something that happens when you start giving back in a way that's complementary. And I learned that from the bees too. When you're complementary to the environment, good things happen. And, and, and it just it just seems to be a, a, a good thing when you see something like that that needs to be fixed and you fix it. I don't really care. I mean, I think it's good. The, the bottom line is, could I sell it again for 95000 Yeah, I could sell it tomorrow for probably 150 But for whatever reason, the gentleman wanted to sell it for down to ninety five, and I was able to buy it. So we've had enough. I think the other big lesson I learned was you can buy a lot of things that aren't for sale. Even when people tell you they don't want to sell them. And, and I, I had an experience where we were involved in a lot of student housing. So my son now runs that company. He's done doing a great job. But we, we found an area where there were lots for sale and you could walk to the university. And we build six and six. So there's six beds to each side of a duplex. Each bedroom has its own bathroom, beautiful bathroom. And it's sort of a communal kitchen. So kids... College kids want to live not in the big high rise thing necessarily with all the, you know, ping pong and stuff to party. Some of them want to live in a house like setting where they can have a community of six. So we started doing this. And then I noticed there were a couple lots that were sitting there not for sale. So we had already built, I don't know, 36 beds. We built through COVID. We built through all. So I, I contacted the person who owned the land and we he didn't want to sell it. I called him a few more times. We negotiated a price. Um, and then when it came time to closing, he didn't want to sell it to me. So I learned very quickly the power of a really good attorney. You know, you litigate for breach of contract. As soon as you serve them, the next day the deal closes, they get their money. They should be happy because I gave them everything they wanted. But the point of all that is there are ways to purchase properties that you can target that you don't that aren't for sale because most people have a price. The land I'm telling you, uh, the ocean land we bought for 300, it wasn't for sale. The stuff beside it for 200, it wasn't for sale. But I just contacted the people and said, hey, you've got this property. We're interested in buying it. What do you think? We made a deal. Yeah. You know, I think land is, is an amazing um, investment, but I think a lot of people overlook it because it's overwhelming. It's like, you know, how, they don't they can't foresee like the future. So I've, I, I think land like what I love about land uh, from the little experience I have is like I can buy it pretty much for pennies on the dollar typically. I can create value by getting plans approved. I could sell it, you know, with entitled plans. Like, hey, I got this raw land and now we've got utilities to the property and you can build a 10 unit building, right? Like you just create, I don't even need to build it. I've tripled the value or, you know, 10X the value of the the, the lot I bought for $7,000 or something like that, right? Absolutely. Like, like, it's not for everybody. I think you have to have, you have to be a good investigator. You have to understand like, you know, what 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 would be your thought process like if you were giving your advice to your son and he didn't have real estate experience and you know and let's just say he wasn't running your student housing business and he was looking to get in real estate how, you know what's that conversation going to look like how are you going to educate them to say hey you know you know this is what i would recommend how you would get started in this business well the first step i did cuz you know people don't like listening to relatives or people close to you or friends I wrote a book called Shrink Money Advice, and I made them edit it and read it for me. Uh, 
So that's how I gave them my first little bit of wisdom. And then I took them around and took them to the projects we were doing and, and start, we're very much having to put a system in place. And I think that's really important. We talked about that before we started the show. So what is it, what should it look like to be in this case, a good student rental? You know, what, what should that income be? What should it cost you? What's the CapEx? What's the uh, management like? And, and with, with the properties, there's some key things. For example, when you're buying land, and let, like you said, you want to divide it. We bought that one property. We turned it into nine lots initially. And I have 36 acres left to divide. Well, in that community, when you divide nine lots, there are no service costs. You don't have to give the municipality any extra money or give them some land for a park. You can do nine and then have that extra 10th piece as the reserve without paying any extra fees. In the community where we did that too, the development plan cost me $10 to file. Okay. So, on, and I said to her, I said, how do I, she'd all oh, will help you. Like it's a community where they wanted to do this kind of thing. They were open and they were, the tax base is very low. The tax is 0.68 of the value of the property. Okay. So hundred thousand, I'm paying six, $680 on that property in taxes. And so they're very, the, the taxes on the community is very important. And the bylaws, I have experts who go in and look at bylaws because frankly, Many of the lawyers who work for municipalities aren't the sharpest because they'd be in private practice. So when they write bylaws, there's always a way to do what you want to do, usually through that bylaw. There's a way. There's and in the States, to... we really call bylaws, CC&Rs, covenants. Uh, yeah. I can't even think of it. Yeah. It's just, bylaws are the same thing as CC&Rs. You know, what, what, you could, what, what can you do with the property? What's the highest and best use? And also that takes some... I mean, one is it sounds like you don't need to maximize density because that's not really your game. Your game is like sustainability. And like you, it sounds like you made your money. You don't need to like maximize every penny. Obviously, you're in business still, but like you're doing a lot. It sounds like you're doing a lot now more for the good of society than rather like to put money in your pocket. Well, what I learned from bees, though, is they're both you have to do it for a business. Every project has to have a business model or it's not helpful. So I agree with you on many points. But but you have to like like when we talk about the 95 acres that was a clear cut log, there has to be a business plan that's going to pay for the costs, take care of the cost of that 95,000 that's not invested somewhere else. And it's got to be a viable business or it's not going to survive. So I think that's one of the things I believe in when it comes to the environment. Yeah, it's important, but it's got to actually help your business. I mean, I got involved with solar because the Ontario government was paying us 80 cents a kilowatt hour for solar to produce solar power, selling it for seven cents and paying us 80 cents. So think about that for me. Is that a smart? <laughs> and these were locked in 20 year contracts and I still have them. And I told everybody I knew, I said, you got it. Oh, no, we don't trust the government. We don't. I said, you're going to make it 14 to 18%. At the time, banks were lining up, giving us money to fund the entire projects with just the panels as collateral. That's how hot this was 13 years ago. And so I did that. I had, right now, we have 13 uh, solar uh, systems, we call them, on different places. And, and we changed that process. But you know, even when there's something like that, it's kind of like that building I told you about, the office building, where they offered me half and I thought it was too good to be true. Even when investors, when you get that opportunity, you have to jump on it. Like I was putting solar on anything I could find. <laughs> like I, had, I said, for that contract, and, and you know what, it's a third, in seven years, it paid it for itself. And, and every month you get a check from the hydro, I'm, I'm a hydro company, basically. That's pretty amazing. I, I think you, you're, you find riches in the niches better than but, most people do. But, but what's frustrating, you know, Bo, what's really frustrating, and maybe you can help me with this, is when you try to grab people and say, you need to do this. Like, this is so great. Like, the income from one solar panel is like 15 grand a year. So why wouldn't you put up a solar system for and, and make 15 grand a year? And, and I would tell people, and they just, well, you know, the government, what if it doesn't do this? What if it does? Yeah, that's all true. It could happen, but uh, I don't know. Yeah, I think you got to go. You got to you got to go with. I think you got to obviously be, you know, you got to do your due diligence to the best of your ability, but you have to take action. I think a lot of people, for whatever reason, they 
have this closed mindset, not a growth mindset where they think, oh, well, all right, this can't happen to me. It's too good to be true. I'm not, I'm just not going to do it. Whereas, you know, if you're, if you're willing to jump in, right, like you're an educated guy, so you're, you're going to do the due diligence, due diligence that you can, right? And there's, there's always that little part, like the what if part, right? But if you never go in, you're never going to be, you know, we're going to get the hit to success, right? You're always going to be like the W2 employee or here we call it W2. I don't know what you call it. Yeah, I know. I know what that is. Yeah. yeah. But here's the point. Like we expect to lose sometimes like any, I know that when a honey beehive swarms, they're 75%, they vote. They're 75% sure the new home they're going to is going to be good for them. Okay. Only 30% roughly are they correct. They're still going to die. So when you make an investment, whatever it is, land we've talked about or a building, how confident are you that it's going to be successful? I will take 70% is great. 65 is pretty good. I know I'm going to fail sometimes. The question is, they can't take me out totally. If I, if I throw the dice on everything, then that's crazy, right? But I have to realize that there's a failure rate where I learn. And, I, and probably my biggest mistake we didn't talk about was the ice cream company. I started an ice cream business in 1990. Biggest mistake of my life. It's my MBA, I call it. <laughs> Huge mistake. Huge. Oh, painful to think about. Yeah. But you worked you worked past it, right? And I think that's when I was telling you before how I made all those mistakes in real estate when I was in my 20s. I worked past it. I Sure, I still have those kind of uh, scars and it, it's probably held me back in certain ways. When you have that kind of that that thorn in your side, you never forget that, which sometimes is a hindrance. But um, I always say this, if you have reserve, if you have adequate reserves, if you think long term, you're going to we're going to hit roadblocks. We're going to get that one house where I can't find a contractor to remodel. It's sitting vacant and it frustrates you. We're going to run into those things, but it's it's you're stacking wins, you know, like you can't expect to go up to the plate and p playing baseball and hit and hit a, a base hit every time. You're gonna strike out, you're gonna get hit by the pitcher, um, but overall, what's your batting average, right? And that's, I think, the big game factor. Like understanding that you're not always gonna hit complete wins and like sometimes this piece of dirt you bought that you thought you could sell in a couple of years ends up, you gotta hold it for seven years, not two years, but you have to have those risks factors in mind and you have to take calculated risk what i the biggest takeaway i just heard from you is that you already know like hey 65 70 percent that it's going to be positive you know obviously we want 80 90 percent but you're you, you get that vibe that uh, then you're going to you got to dive into it right like if you f have that good vibe you should work towards getting it in under contract and you can have your your escape clauses in that contract too many people will like be kicking the curb like, well, what if this, what if this? Well, somebody else swoops in and buys it and then you don't get to get that property. Whereas you should be taking action if you have that, if it, well, if it looks like a 70% or better. What I worry today, Bo, is about young people who don't have a system. So they go based on emotion. So they buy something because everybody's buying it or they think they can flip. Like when we talk about Airbnb, I my, my son and I have this debate a lot because I think Airbnb is like, there are two parts to the business. There's the real estate and then there's a personal service business. So you can be a great real estate investor, but if you don't care the quality of the coffee I'm drinking when I come and stay at your place, we're going to have a problem. Or if the towels aren't great, you know, you got to be like a Hilton guy while you're a real estate. And I don't like that. And secondly, your, your platform, you're building for someone else. That platform goes away. What happens to your Airbnb? They go bankrupt and they shut down or something happens. People say, well, there's other platforms. Yeah, but you're relying on Airbnb for this 500, 700 million plus dollar investment. And you're a hotel and hotels lobby. They And, and what's happening in Canada, in most places, they're becoming illegal. I yeah, mean, yeah. on our national news yesterday in, in near Winnipeg, Manitoba, of all places. I mean, it's probably still minus 30 there. They had an Airbnb one night, 17 grand in damage. Mm. And so this is what you see on the national news, right? So in Windsor, which is near Detroit, they just started a licensing apartment business for student housing. So the municipality is trying out to license landlords. They have to pay a fee for every door, every every bed. They're going to have to have a certain inspection. A certain, so, and then they say, well, there's no housing. No one, well, who would build housing in that community if you're going to have all that bureaucratic 
stuff going on. Yeah, right? there's gonna be there's gonna be big pushback because what even here in Las Vegas, what they're doing and like you can buy in Airbnbs and get a permit in certain parts like that are unincorporated. It's just a huge pain in the rear end. Um, and I I don't know. I it's it's a hard debate. And I think like they just they just passed these rules and a, and a and a judge threw it out and said you can't do this. It's not you know. You, you just can't set these laws like the way they did it. So they have to rework it. And so, yeah, there's a lot of variable risks. Um, I think it, I, th I know a lot of successful uh, short term rental operators that are crushing it. Um, you know, I know others that are probably getting jumping in because everybody else is jumping in and they're not going to crush it. And they're going to realize just like in flipping houses, right? Like everybody thinks they can flip a house until they actually go and do it. And then they have the issues like, well, you know, and then, and then I asked people like, I was bad at this. I was always thinking about the future or what about the past? And I said, can you assess what's happening right now? And I learned that from the bees, eh? every 15 minutes, all 47, 40, sorry, 40,000 bees know the status of the queen in real time. So when I ask investors, I say, right now, do you know the status of everything around you, like inflation, cost of money? Right now, forget about next week, forget about yesterday. Most people don't focus on that. When I focused on inflation, I, up here, our government said it was 9%. It was actually 15%. I go to the grocery store, I calculate it, There's no, I buy gas, and they say, well, we exclude gas and food. Well, that's not real inflation. So I locked in all our mortgages. We had mortgages two years ago on some of our properties and the banker tried to talk me out of it. He said, oh, two and a half percent. He said, it's going to be a one and a half or it might even drop more. Just don't worry about it. I said, no, no, we're going to lock in everything for up here. The longest is five, sometimes 10 years. And we're fortunate we did because those two and a half percent mortgages that we've locked in are now four and a half, five and a half, six percent, which is cash flow. So, but as a young investor, sometimes you listen to bankers because you think, they know what they're talking about. Well, if they knew what they're talking about, they wouldn't be bankers. And this is what people don't understand. And, and so I would sit with bankers when I started as a clinician, they see the doctor. So they think they can pull me into money management, right? So I'd go to these meetings a couple of times with my wife. And I'd look at this person, I'd say, you want me to give you want me to give you my money? Yep. I said, Okay, what's your credit card balance? And they said, we don't have to tell you that. I said, Well, you ask me, you know, my credit history is right in front of you. I said, what's your well, I don't have to. I said, what's your net worth? He said, well, we're not going to, I don't have to tell you. I said, well, you, you're going to advise me on what stocks and bonds and mutual funds to buy. I want to know how successful you are as an investor. Well, we, we're not going to tell you. That's, that's dumb. I said, well, that's it. I'm out of here. And, and, and that's the problem. Young people listen mm. and other people too, and they don't take responsibility for their money. And that's a big concern I have with our young people today and older people. We don't, we don't, we're not smart with our money. We weren't taught. And so we give it to people. We'll check out the auto mechanic or the HVAC guy forever or where to eat food. But when it comes to our retirement, we just fork it over. We just give it to people. Yeah. I hope it, it's there. You know, It's scary to think about all these people that are going to have to work the rest of their lives and never have, uh, you know, that that's, that's, it's so important. And, and it, it's a good point. Like the people that you're getting your advice from, these guys want you to put all your money with them. It's like, well, you know, how many real, how many houses do you own? How many, how much land do you own? What, what's in your bank? Do you have any debt? Like, you know, I think that's, that's true. Like I'm going to listen to you when I've been extremely successful in real estate, you know, owning real estate. Why would I want to, I mean, do I want to diversify a little bit from real estate? Of course I'm, you know, I invest in some startups, some are high risk and, you know, I only put a little bit of money in that. And then I invest in some um, short term mortgages, um, which, you know, pay eight to 12%, you know, uh, annually. I think it's good to have some diversity, but I'm picking what I'm putting it in and I'm learning and I'm watching and I'm paying attention versus like, Hey, I have a 401k and it's with, you know, XYZ mutual fund company, you know, over time, can you make money in mutual funds? Of course. But I think like the problem is, is that it's really hard for, for me, I can, you know, I look around, I see these people making six figure jobs, making pretty good money. At the end of the day, they have no savings left because they spend too much. They don't, we gotta, we gotta teach people early on. Like I was like terrible with my money when I was younger and I could be so, so much further ahead. I didn't understand like investing, compound interest, like rule of 72, all these, all these things that it's so important. The one saving grace I think 
is I look at real estate as a, a forced savings account for me that appreciates like crazy. I can leverage it a little bit uh, or a lot. And that to me, that was awesome. And the other thing that I liked about real estate, uh, you know, starting out, you don't really have a lot of money. You have to be able to leverage. And so I could leverage buying on terms, seller finance. I could use other people's money. I could get private investors, hard money loan. I could figure out how to buy these properties and quickly, you know, uh, you know, quickly build my net worth faster than any other way I could figure out. So I think real oh, estate is, go is ahead, a good sorry. long. Yeah, no, that's all I was saying. I was just going to say, like, I, I say to people, let's say you bought a house for a hundred grand and it was a rental. And 25 years later, the tenants pay off the mortgage and you sell it for a hundred grand. How much money have you made? And everybody says nothing. And I said, no, you made a hundred grand. Assuming it cash flowed to the point of paying all your bills. You, assume you got no money, which is a bad investment. And it just paid all your bills and the interest and the mortgage and everything. You've made a hundred thousand tax-free dollars by just taking care of that property for 25 years. That's it. And so people... They, they say, yeah, but I want to flip it. Or I had a guy call me yesterday. They, there must be a lot of bad stuff going on because he's a multi-unit sales guy. They don't usually call me. I get the emails, right? But I don't get the call. He goes, Hank, I got this great building in Toronto. I go, really? What's great about it? Well, it's a, it's a five cap. And I go, oh, what are interest rates? He goes, about six. I go, well, uh, he goes, oh, but it's a great building because the plan is you can kick out all the tenants and you could raise the rent. And I said, well, first of all, there's a problem kicking out all the people on the street because it's Toronto and maybe they're paying 1500 now. And if you put in the CapEx, you can get 2200 But in the meantime, you've got, you know, 20 angry people and it's not legal. And he said, yeah, but you can then the price will go up. I said, no, you don't know any of that. I said, what's the state of the building? He goes, it's in a great neighborhood. I said, no, you didn't. My question was, what's the state of the building? Ah, he says it needs a lot of work. So, I mean... I said, I'll wait till it's a 15 cap and then call me. He said, well, that'll never happen. I said, oh, did you know Richard Branson bought an island in the Caribbean? Did you hear that story? He goes, no. I go, well, it was for sale for 3.5 million pounds. And he offered 150,000. And they were appalled. They said it was a low ball, blah, blah, blah. He bought it for 170,000. And it was listed for 3.5 million. So I think people sometimes are afraid to hurt people's feelings or... It's what's the value for you. And that to me is something that we learn over time and we mentor. And, and I don't mentor anybody new, but I've mentored some young people and they're all now multimillionaires doing great. And, I'll, and, and I don't care if people listen, meaning do what I say, just process it and listen and then throw it in the garbage. 99% of the entrepreneurs I talk to cannot stop, listen, and then throw it out in the garbage. I respect you if you do it. If you just think of your next defense line before even considering the crazy idea I just threw at you, we don't have any time together. And that's the problem today. 99% of people in the investment and real estate business won't process or learn from those mistakes. And that's the problem. That's true. Because everybody thinks they're, they know everything. <laughs> See, I don't know anything. And I, I've been at it for a long time. And, and I got to tell you, one of my favorite interview questions of new staff when I was a clinician. And now when I talk to entrepreneurs, I say, okay, if a hundred percent is everything you need to have skill wise to do this, whatever it is, job or profession, what percent do you think you have now? And a lot of people coming out of school would say, I'm at 80 or 90%. I went to a good school. I know quite a bit. I, and then I would say, which is the truth. I'm at about 20 after 30 years. And some of them would say, well, I went to a better school or they would defend their night. But no, if you're lucky, you get to 20 percent, because if you flip the coin in 50 and you add 20, you're at a 70 percent success rate, which is huge. Warren Buffett's at 72 or something. If you can get to 70 percent, you're owning it. But people don't understand that it's a lifetime of learning, which is huge in real estate, investing. And, and then you've got to stick to your guns because those emotions, we're all human, right? And, and the emotions start kicking in. Should I buy? Everybody's buying. Should I sell? Everybody's selling. And that's when I think we get into trouble. Yeah. And then, it, you know, if you can not, if you can weather those storms and, and buy when people are selling, you get even better deals, a lot better deals. It's hard to do though. Hey, Bo, have you, have you had some of those gut wrenching decisions where you go in and buy when the, the world's crashing? Um, 
Yeah, I, I, um, you know, like I was, I got really hurt in 2007 financially, 2007, eight and nine. And I was like, I got to start buying again, but I had ruined my credit. <laughs> it was a terrible time. I was in my <laughs> mid, mid, probably my late twenties at the time. But I was like, okay, I know it's a great time. I could go onto the multiple listing service on, and just buy houses that need to be renovated and make money. So I, I figured it out, right? I got a, I got a money partner, I got a contractor and I would find the deals and we just share the profits 33%, you know, nice split. And so with bad credit and no money, I was able to make money. And so that's what I love about real estate too, because you know, it is easier if you have a bunch of money, like you can go pay cash now, right? Where a lot of people can't, but if you learn these tools and learn about the fundamentals of real estate, you can go out and make anything happen, right? Like, cause it's really just the power of what's up here. Hi, this is Bo Eckstein, host of the Investor Financing Podcast. Are you a real estate investor with properties and you're trying to figure out how to refinance or grow your existing real estate business? Need some clarity and a game plan for moving forward? I'm offering a free strategy call where we dive deep on your real estate investing goals. I'll help you come up with a strategic finance plan that will help you get to where you want to go. Whether you've got a portfolio of 30 properties or you're starting out with your first property, I have a framework that has helped many investors grow. If you're interested, book a call below in the Calendly link. And having a team, you know, like I, I would always negotiate mortgages for the quarter percentage point better difference, right? And then I realized after doing this for about 28 years and dealing with all this stuff, I started to develop relationships. We have them up here called credit unions. Mm -hmm. And I have a couple of relationships we have now with amazing people at credit unions who aren't like typical bankers. Many credit unions are, but many aren't. And the, the two that we deal with are absolutely amazing people. And they, they know your business. They'll drive down and look at a development. Or I'll call them up and tell them, I'm thinking of doing this. What do you think of this property? And they know the area. And we talk about it. And they're involved. It's not just, you know, I'll never forget. When I'm when I'm looking for money to real bank, you know, the bigger banks, they would say things like, well, your ratio numbers are too low or this doesn't work or you got too many loans. Or I remember one one person I was buying property in Nova Scotia in a place called Antigonish, which is a university town. And the TD Bank calls me up from Toronto and they say, we don't we don't do mortgages in fishing villages. And I said, well, do you know where Annie Ganesh is? And she says, no, it's in Nova Scotia. It's a fishing. I goes, no, it's a university town. There's no water there. There's no fishing. It's got the, you know, regional hospital. It's got all, doesn't matter. In her mind, it was a fishing and they're just mm. stupid, right? But the credit unions, do you have comparable kinds of lenders that you can access for your people in the States? Yeah. Yeah. So we, I, I place a lot of commercial deals. And so um, I always tell people, if some people aren't bankable, I mean, like they're, they're yeah. the banks, yeah. the credit unions, nobody will lend to them. So sometimes we need private debt, you know, and we arrange all that kind of stuff. But what I do now is because I have a lot of relationships with credit unions and a lot of times credit unions are, is the best debt out there because they oftentimes don't have any prepayment penalties or yield maintenance. So we have a platform that we can we, we source credit unions. So it doesn't even have to be a local credit union because sometimes local credit unions don't really like commercial loans. Mm -hmm. And so we, we, we have a platform. We put the deals on the platform. We get multiple bids. So we're okay. using technology. But yes, I agree with you 100 percent. And a lot of it, sometimes I tell people, hey, this deal is not I, I can't help you go find a, a local credit union for this deal. That's how you're going to get it done. And I agree with you 100 percent. The relationship vendor with, take backs. Do you, do you get many of those that, that happen or you wouldn't see them because they wouldn't come to you for the money? Yeah. Like the foreclosures, we call them foreclosures. No, just straight up. Like I, I was fortunate in life. I had a few of those when I started in life, people gave me that opportunity. Actually, people gave my dad that opportunity to buy this farm. The person selling it said to him, cause he didn't have the money. We'll take a mortgage back. You pay us. And I've had some of those opportunities in my oh, life. Yes. And now I give them back to other people when we sell a building sometimes. Yeah. We call it seller carry back. Okay, is that common? Yeah, and especially right now, because the rates have gone up, right? So some of the multifamily loans, we call it Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, agency right. debt, you can assume those loans. But oftentimes, like if I'm buying a single family property, 
um, I could, I, and it's free and clear, I could ask the seller, hey, because it's a- advantageous for them for tax purposes. They only pay what's on the installment that year. They don't have to pay taxes on the full sale price, whatever. Uh, so it is. And then also, too, it's, what's popular here is people are buying properties subject to. Right. Uh, although, like, everybody's scared that the bank's going to accelerate the loan because it says in the docs you can't, buy, you know, you can't, if you transfer title, the loan could be accelerated. But many investors are, so, like, there's a lot of people that bought with FHA loans here, and they might have 2% money or 2.5% money. But now they're, the market came down, they're over leveraged, they need to sell. Well, if they sell, they're going to do a short sale and ruin their credit. So they might be a good candidate for me to come in and say, hey, I'll buy it subject to, right? I go, I, my business entity owns the property now. I make payments. They, their name is still on the mortgage, though. Um, so a lot of the investors that I know are buying stuff subject to because it takes very little money, and then you're getting 2 or 3% debt. What's the cost to build now? Do you have a, a sort of number? Say it's an average house, maybe not crazy granite counters, but you know, a nice place you'd like to live in. What's the square foot cost to build or replace? Yeah, I mean, I, I, it, it definitely it definitely varies. Um, you know, where in the states, um, but if like Las Vegas, you know, I don't pay too much attention. I do some construction loans, but um, you know, for custom home versus just a you know kind of a cookie cutter home, I would say. You know, custom homes could be in the four to five hundred dollar a square foot range. You know, in certain areas, I've seen seven or eight hundred uh, for like a track home, like like a little cheap house. You know, people can build at a hundred or one hundred and twenty five a square foot. Okay, okay, because that to me is part of the value. I mean, obviously, it's income, and there's other ways to assess value, but certainly a piece of that is the cost of that versus what you're buying already built, right? I mean, there's a lot of ways to look at it. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I've never done any ground up stuff myself, and I, I'm really interested in building something for the experience of it. And like, because what I see is like, hey, I can go to this city, you know, an hour away from my Las Vegas area. I can buy a lot for 20 grand or 15 grand. I can put a duplex on it or whatever. And, you know, the value is X. My total cost is X. I'm creating $75,000 of equity of day one. I'm going to have a thousand dollars a month of cash flow or whatever right like to me i see that it's just uh, having the right contractor and so forth right you, you, you got to get started though if you want to do it we did you know we've done a number of student houses from ground up and it, it and i also did a major building with a partner in niagara falls a federal building we built and we, we have the government as our tenant and i can tell you my experience and my partner said this is it's the most brutal business on the planet and you can't believe anyone and everything you do, I mean, we only do closed contracts. So if you say we're going to build a house for 400 grand or duplex for 400 grand, it's going to be 400 grand. I'm not going to give you a penny more. That's the contract. That's the legal contract. And two years ago, we started looking at doing another build and those contracts people didn't want to look at because they could just jack the price throughout the build, right? Because there was supply issues, COVID, you got every excuse. So we canceled all their construction. We haven't built anything in two years because contractors law. I, I said to mo- mo- a few of them, I said, I know you're a neurosurgeon now, but we're not going to pay you that money. You know, we're just not going to, we'll wait. Well, what are you going to do? Well, we'll wait. And we've been waiting. And now they're calling me. Do you still want to do a project? Because all of a sudden things are getting softer out there. So I think you have to be careful um because if you don't have a closed contract you know you're going to get that fifty thousand dollar request for extra groundwork that seems to be common or this or that which don't you know yeah it's a a weird business yeah well then then i think like eventually like these modular type of builds where you already know you know what you're paying for all you then you're doing is finish work and and hookups to utilities and you know the, the the hardscape the driveways and stuff that Eventually, when they can create a product that's like better than site build, I mean, they probably do it already, I know, but that would be an easier kind of in the mind kind of thing, right? I could just go buy, buy a, and they're coming out with all these ADU units, we call them accessory dwelling units, where they're allowing us to increase density. So that's a good value add opportunity here in certain markets, like in California, they want, we're, we have such a shortage of housing that if you have, you know, you can you can get fast track to get like a accessory dwelling unit built in the backyard. So you can put it, you can make these single family homes, duplexes. You can also add what we call a junior ADU. You can convert garages into living space. So I just interviewed a guy on my podcast 
Um, and we were talking about that because that's how he created his financial freedom is he would move into a house. He would, we call it house hacking here. And then he would add an ADU unit. He then, he'd get high leverage, cheap debt from a bank. Then he'd go buy another owner occupied, right? He did that five times. Now he owns, he has like 16 units now, but he's financially free with relatively not that much heavy lifting, which is. The last houses we bought last year, actually we did buy four tiny homes. We had them built off site and brought to different. My son had two and I bought two. And it was the price we agreed upon, but we had COVID fake delays, I called them. They weren't real delays. They were just better work elsewhere until we finish your tiny homes. And it was ridiculous. But anyway, we do have them on site. And now we're sort of looking at how to their uh, oceanfront. They have rooftop balconies. Uh, they're, they're quite nice, actually. I mean, it's amazing what you can do in a 260-square-foot tiny home with a rooftop balcony. 11-foot high ceilings, high-speed internet. Uh, they're all one bedroom and closed bathroom. So they're quite nice, but I can't live in them for very long. I like space. Yeah, I would never want to live in it. I like, I need, you know, there's my wife, myself, and a dog, and I like it. I have 2,600 square feet, which is, I, nice. I could actually, that's, this is like the bare minimum square footage that I need. I know, yeah, with, the, you know, because I air conditioning, I live in the desert and stuff, I could probably do more conservative but i do need room because i work out of that my house a lot too so i yeah i took two bedrooms i knocked down the wall and i made a huge home office and but i need I space think the biggest so. theme i got out of covid was people want space not just physical space but space from other people so you want to be on a lot like the one property we're developing it's one acre lots and we put a tiny home on one and a half acres so you have all this space to be away from your neighbors. So if you want to, you know, have a big garden or throw a solar panel up, you have that option. So I think physical space is necessary, but that's hard to do in a in a city where you're all tight and, and yeah. land's well, so expensive. Well, with like if I did like a uh, let's just say I found a great area for a short term rental and I did a tiny house, I would do some kind of outdoor like uh, outdoor space that made it feel bigger, right? Like it's it's the the your it has a covered top and then it kind of flows from the steps and then people could utilize all the space and not feel so cramped up. But yeah, it's, 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 it's interesting how all this stuff is these rural properties here in the States, like in like Joshua tree. Now they're like the hottest thing since sliced bread. Everybody's, you know, buying these and fixing them up and getting short term rentals in there. Um, but you're, you are right. Like, you know, you can't, a lot of my friends are starting to build their own platforms. So, they get a lot of repeat business so they're not just dependent on like the airbnbs or the vrbos or but um yeah i would have to say that the other thing here too is like there's because they consider that an active business there's certain tax deductions you can take if you do we do cost segregation and accelerated depreciation mm -hmm. you can write off against earned income here so it's there's a lot of interesting things you can do in real estate and specific to like what you what you've done student housing um you know land banking um kind of creative right like you've you're not a traditional like hey i'm gonna buy this multifamily property you've kind of done a little outside the box stuff you've carved your own path right to, to like making good deals and then not and not being afraid to say hey this deal sucks i'm not gonna buy this deal i'll wait three years if i have to so i think the moral of the story is is like you know only buy good deals don't be in a rush. <laughs> um, what are what are some of uh, the other? What did the honeybees teach us? Come on, we gotta we gotta go over all this. Well, I'll tell you a quick one. What you just talked about, we would have to make thirty offers to get an accepted one that we would buy. So for every ten offers, one would get accepted, but for every three accepted, we would only do one. So it would take thirty offers in a good market or a balanced market for us to get one. So that was kind of the stat. So at first I'd get all upset if something didn't get accepted or I had to walk from a property. Home. But that became very quickly the rule. From the honeybees, as you probably know, I brought it up a few times, they taught me about, you know, don't lose your money. You have to survive. Survival is number one for bees, and I think it should be for investors. Number two, little bits become big bits. 
So that's compounding. That's I had buildings where I'd have a couple empty offices because I thought it was just too much of a hassle to rent to other people. And I was losing like a grand a month on this one. And I could have made an extra 500 on this one. And once I started realizing that you can become that much more profitable. So little bits become big bits, you know, and I realized that with rental right now where I have all these controls where you can only raise rent 2%. And people say, well, 2%, is it worth it? Yeah, you should do whatever you can when you can, because those little pieces become big pieces. Uh, probability, before you do something, what's the probability of failure? Like the honeybees, they actually have a 70, they actually vote, a eh? 75% have to vote to move or they won't move. A big one is if you don't like where you live, move. We have people in Toronto who complain, they say, well, it costs 750 grand to get a one bedroom uh, condo. So don't live there, go move somewhere else. Uh, and, and that's a hard one to sell. I was talking to some young people that say, you don't understand Toronto's the center of activity. I said, well, you're going to pay for that. Just don't complain about it. Mm -hmm. um, a, a couple of others that we've learned had to do with when you get to a fight, let's say, and I've had to deal with a number of challenges with municipalities over building. You don't have to fight all the way to the end with litigation, but the people that are opposing you have to know you're willing to do that. And I found that with that example of the person that didn't want to close on those deals when they legally had to. I, I don't like the conflict, but sometimes you have to take a stand and you have to make that decision. And you brought it up earlier. You know, you have to make a decision and, and you have to act on it. Bees act, even though there's a probability of failure. And you only learn when you fail. I mean, that's, that's, that's the truth. So if you avoid failure, you're never going to learn. And that's another lesson from the bees. Wow. Well, we went way over time. Sorry, Sorry about man. that. But we <laughs> talked about a lot of good stuff on this episode. And you guys can learn more from Hank by going to wildflowerbeefarm.com. Wildflowerbeefarm.com. You can get a copy of his book. You can. What else can they find there? We've got, you know, a lot of free stuff for kids. There's coloring book pages from my wife taking pictures of the farm. There's lesson plans if you're homeschooling or teachers. We have lesson plans on videos. We post videos regularly. We're also on Instagram. We post once or twice a week what's happening around the farm. And there's all kinds of information there as we continue to build it out. Very good. Well, thank you so much. It was thank a, you both. A, a great conversation. Thanks everybody for watching this. I hope you guys took a lot of notes or at least mental notes because uh, you know, real estate does not lie. There's lots of opportunities, up, down markets. Just know where you're at, know all your signs and, and listen to good podcasts and listen to people that have been doing it for 40 years. Thanks so much. Thanks, Bo. All the best. Hey guys, Bo Exine here. If you enjoyed what you saw, please subscribe to this channel. We talk all things financing. I've been in the lending industry for over 20 years and I'm happy to answer your questions and provide great content.